Hi, my name is Ben Berg, and today I want to talk to you about optimally scheduling parallelizable jobs where some jobs are perfectly parallelizable and other jobs are less parallelizable. This is joint work with Moore Harko Balter, Ben Mosley, Wayne Wing, and Justin Whitehouse, and we're in the computer science department at Carnegie Mellon University. Today I want to talk about scheduling parallelizable jobs, and specifically I want to talk about scheduling in data centers. Data centers are purpose-built to exploit parallelism and they often consist of thousands of servers. Modern data centers are tasked with processing heterogeneous workloads of jobs which arrive to the system over time. These jobs can vary along several dimensions. For example, jobs can vary in size or duration, meaning that some jobs represent a small amount of computation while other jobs represent a massive amount of computation. Likewise, jobs can vary in their level of parallelizability meaning that some jobs will scale well across many servers, while other jobs will only be able to leverage a small number of servers. Our question in today's talk is, in light of this heterogeneity, how should we allocate servers to jobs in our data center? To answer this question, we'll have to come up with a model of how parallelizable jobs run in our data center. In our data center, a single job can run on multiple servers. However, jobs often have a dependency structure which limits their ability to scale across many servers. Likewise, a job might have some communication overhead between tasks that affects its performance. To summarize these concepts, we'll use a speed up curve which describes job parallelizability. This is hopefully a familiar concept, but let's look at an example. On the x-axis here, we have a number of servers k, and on the y-axis, we have a speed up function s of k. This red line then describes the benefit that a job gets from running on additional servers. For example, this job runs four times as fast when run on eight servers as it would when run on a single server. Our problem considers a data center with some fixed number of servers, k. For example, this data center has k equals 16 servers. Jobs arrive to our data center and must be scheduled onto some of the servers in order to be completed. Here, we'll allocate all 16 of our servers to this job one. For each job, we can imagine measuring the time between when the job arrives to the system and when it is completed. We refer to this as job's response time, T. Many jobs might arrive to our system over time, and our goal in this talk will be to minimize the mean response time, E of T, across jobs. This might require reallocating some servers from the blue job to the other jobs that have arrived. For simplicity, we assume that this reallocation can be done instantaneously and without overhead. Prior work has considered similar problems. In particular, a 2009 paper provides an O of 1 plus epsilon speed O of 1 over epsilon competitive policy. Without using speed augmentation, a 2016 paper provides an O of log P competitive policy where P is the ratio of the largest job size to the smallest job size. Unfortunately, this ratio P can be many orders of magnitude in practice. To make matters worse, the O of log P competitive ratio is nearly tight to a lower bound on competitive ratio provided by Lenardi and Ross in 2007. So the question is, given this strong lower bound, how shall we make progress on this problem? Our answer in today's talk is to make some stochastic assumptions that will allow us to move past this lower bound. In particular, we'll make the following stochastic assumptions. We'll assume that job interarrival times are drawn from a distribution, and that it's therefore unlikely that jobs show up all at once or infinitely far into the future. We'll also assume that job sizes are drawn from a distribution, making it unlikely that arbitrarily small or arbitrarily large jobs will arrive to the system. Finally, we'll assume that job parallelizability is drawn from the distribution, meaning an adversary can't pack the system with sequential jobs and then follow that with a largely parallelizable job. Our goal in making these stochastic assumptions is to optimize for the common case, not the worst case scenario. To reflect these stochastic assumptions, we let each job size be drawn from some underlying distribution. We assume that these job sizes are random and unknown to the system. Furthermore, as jobs arrive randomly to the system over time, 
we define lambda to be the average arrival rate of jobs to the system in jobs per second. As previously stated, we'll use speedup functions to describe a job's parallelizability. Again, we can think of having servers on the x-axis and speedup function s of k on the y-axis, where the speedup function denotes a job service rate on k servers. We'll allow jobs to belong to one of two speedup classes. First, we have elastic jobs, which receive a perfect speedup as denoted by this blue line. Second, we'll have inelastic jobs, which receive perfect speedup, but only up to some point, as denoted by this red line. For example, these inelastic jobs are parallelizable up to three servers. It turns out that, without loss of generality, it will suffice to consider the case where inelastic jobs are parallelizable up to one server. The trick is just to renormalize the units on the x-axis so that inelastic jobs appear parallelizable up to one unit of allocation. We'll allow our two speedup classes to differ in more than just speedup curve. We'll assume that elastic jobs arrive to the system according to a Poisson process with rate lambda sub e, and we'll assume that inelastic jobs arrive to the system according to a Poisson process with rate lambda sub i. Similarly, we'll assume that elastic job sizes are exponentially distributed with rate mu sub e, while inelastic job sizes are exponentially distributed with rate mu sub i. Given this model, we'd like to find allocation policies, which define at every moment in time the number of servers allocated to each job in the system. The goal of an allocation policy, again, is to minimize the mean response time across jobs. So, given this model, what are some natural policies? Well, we might imagine that there's some set of jobs that's arrived to the system. For example, this set of one elastic job and three inelastic jobs. One natural policy might be to allocate all 16 of our servers to the elastic job, since it is perfectly parallelizable. We'll refer to this policy, which gives priority to elastic jobs first as elastic first, or EF. Analogously, we might imagine that we would instead want to give priority to each of these inelastic jobs. Because each inelastic job can only utilize at most one server, we could imagine allocating first one server to each of our three inelastic jobs, and then using the leftover idle servers to run this elastic job. This policy, which gives priority to the inelastic jobs, we'll call inelastic first, or IF. To make sure we're all on the same page, let's take a look at a quick example. Consider the case where we have a single inelastic job in the system. This leaves us with really just one option, which is to allocate a single server to the lone inelastic job. Under this allocation, the time until the next completion is distributed exponentially with rate mu i. This means that the expected time until the next completion is one over mu i, the reciprocal of the exponential rate. As a bit of terminology, we'll say that the total service rate of the system in this case is mu i jobs per second. This denotes that if we were to use this allocation over a long time horizon, we would finish jobs on average at a rate of mu i jobs per second. We could also consider a slightly more complex example with two inelastic jobs, although this still doesn't leave us many options with regards to allocation. We'll now allocate a single server to each of the inelastic jobs. In this case, the time until the next completion is distributed as the minimum of two exponentials with rate mu i, which is distributed as exponential with rate two mu i. Again, the expected time until the next completion is the reciprocal of this exponential rate, or one over two mu i. We'll now say that the total service rate of the system in this case is two mu i jobs per second. Finally, let's consider our more heterogeneous workload from before, with three inelastic jobs and one elastic job. Let's consider using the inelastic first allocation policy, which allocates a server to the third inelastic job and then allocates the remaining 13 servers to the elastic job. Under this policy, the time until the next completion is distributed as the minimum of three exponentials with rate mu i and one exponential with rate mu e. However, because the elastic job is run on 13 servers, 
That's an exponential with rate BUE divided by 13. This is equivalent to an exponential with rate 3 mu i plus 13 mu e. Again, the expected time until the next completion is the reciprocal of this rate, or 1 over 3 mu i plus 13 mu e, and the total service rate of the system is 3 mu i plus 13 mu e jobs per second. Now that we understand how allocation policies in this model work, let's talk about choosing an allocation policy to achieve our goal of minimizing mean response time. One idea is that because elastic jobs can be perfectly parallelized, the optimal policy should exploit this whenever possible and give priority to elastic jobs, or EF. Another idea is that by giving priority to inelastic jobs, the optimal policy might seek to maintain flexibility in the system by leaving elastic jobs for when they're needed later. However, both of these policies ignore a crucial piece of intuition from prior scheduling work, which is that in general, it's good to complete short jobs first. Therefore, maybe we think that the optimal policy depends on the setting of the job sizes. Perhaps the thing to do is just complete the jobs which are smaller on average first. We can imagine looking at mu i and mu e on the x and y axis respectively and dividing this graph into two regions, a lower triangular region where inelastic jobs are smaller on average because mu i is greater than mu e, and an upper triangular region where elastic jobs are smaller on average because mu i is less than mu e. In the lower triangular region, it might make sense to favor the smaller inelastic jobs and use IF, while in the upper triangular region, it might make sense to favor the elastic jobs, which are smaller on average. The policy that I'm proposing could be thought of as greedy, since it's always trying to complete the shortest jobs available. Equivalently, this policy is trying to greedily maximize the total service rate of the system in each state. So we have this intuition that completing short jobs first is good. Let's look at each of the cases below with some examples to see if our intuition holds up. Let's first consider the case where mu i is greater than or equal to mu e. Recall that this means that inelastic jobs are smaller on average, and hence we're interested in the performance of the IF policy. We'll consider an example where we have one large elastic job and one small inelastic job in the system. In this case, IF allocates one server to the inelastic job and 15 servers to the elastic job. We can consider the total service rate under IF, which is K minus one mu E plus mu I, versus the total service rate under EF, which would be K mu E. Due to the ordering of mu E and mu I, we can see that the total service rate under IF is greater in this case, and will in fact be greater no matter what jobs are in the system. We therefore say that IF is greedily maximizing the total service rate of the system. Note that when we finish the smaller inelastic job, we'll be left with an idle server that we can reallocate to the elastic job. This elastic job will make perfect use of this additional server. So our intuition seems pretty good in this case. We were able to complete a small job first, and the leftover elastic job was able to make perfect use of our additional server. Let's now consider the second case where mu i is less than mu e. Here, elastic jobs are smaller on average, so we'll consider the EF policy. Let's look at the analogous example where we now have a small elastic job and a large inelastic job in the system. The EF policy allocates all 16 servers to the elastic job. We can again see that this is greedily maximizing the total service rate of the system. However, let's look at what happens when the elastic job departs we can now only allocate one server to the remaining inelastic job. Somehow, our systems become very inefficient once the elastic job departs, leaving only inelastic jobs left. Hence, while there probably is some benefit to completing a smaller job first, this might be outweighed by this period of time where we have many idle servers. What's really going on here is that we've uncovered a trade-off in our system between maximizing the current service rate and maintaining the future efficiency of the system. To visualize this, let's think of the current state of the system as some bag of goods. Here we have three inelastic jobs and three elastic jobs. If we finish an elastic job, we'll move to this future state where we have three inelastic jobs and two elastic jobs. 
If we finish an inelastic job, we'll move to the future state with two inelastic jobs and three elastic jobs. My question is, which of these two future states do we prefer, the bag of goods on the left or the bag of goods on the right? We can see that the bag of goods on the right is composed of more flexible jobs. Because we have an additional elastic job, we should be less concerned about running into the scenario where we have no elastic jobs to saturate the servers in our system. However, the bag of goods on the left is less flexible. Because it has fewer elastic jobs, we should be more concerned about running into this future period of low efficiency. Let's consider the first case where mu i is greater than or equal to mu e. In this case, if is the greedy policy. IF will tend to complete inelastic jobs first, pushing us towards this more flexible state. This is why our intuition worked in this case. We were able to both maximize the current service rate of the system and preserve future efficiency. However, if we consider the reverse case where mu i is less than mu e, EF is now the greedy policy. EF tends to complete elastic jobs first, pushing us towards less flexible states. This is where our intuition broke down we now have to balance the current service rate of the system with future efficiency. What's nice is that all this intuition is borne out exactly in the math. For instance, we can prove a theorem that says that IF is the optimal policy with respect to mean response time if mu i is greater than or equal to mu e. To do this, we'll exploit Little's law, which says that it suffices to minimize the mean number of jobs in the system E of n. We'll consider our case server system with jobs arriving over time and define some additional quantities to help us. We'll define n sub e of t to be the number of elastic jobs in the system at time t. And we'll define n sub i of t to be the number of inelastic jobs in the system. We'll let w sub e of t be the amount of elastic work in the system at time t. This is the sum of the sizes of all the elastic jobs in the system. We'll let w sub i of t be the amount of inelastic work in the system at time t. Hence, if at time t we had the following set of jobs in the system, we would have that n sub e of t is 1, and w sub e of t is this random quantity x sub e. Similarly, we would have that n sub i of t is 3, because we have three inelastic jobs, and w sub i of t is the sum of three random variables representing the sizes of these three inelastic jobs. The key to our proof is the following lemma which states that when mu i is greater than or equal to mu e, the following two properties are satisfied. First, if minimizes the amount of expected inelastic work in the system. Second, if minimizes the expected amount of total work in the system. This first property is relatively straightforward. Because if always gives priority to inelastic jobs, if must be minimizing the expected amount of inelastic work in the system. The second property is a little less straightforward, but follows directly from the trade-off we've discussed. IF is not only maximizing the total service rate of the system in the current state, but is pushing the system towards more efficient future states. Hence, IF will always maximize the total service rate of the system and will minimize the amount of expected total work in the system. We can now apply this lemma to finish our proof. First, we'll write down two expressions that relate the expected amount of work in the system to the expected number of jobs in the system for both inelastic and elastic jobs. Then, we'll write an expression for the expected total number of jobs in the system broken into both inelastic and elastic components. We now apply the above relations to get an expression for the expected number of jobs in the system in terms of the expected amount of work in the system. We now perform a convenient addition and subtraction to get the following statement. It's now time to apply our lemma. The first property of our lemma tells us that IF minimizes the amount of expected inelastic work in the system. The second property of our lemma tells us that IF minimizes the expected amount of total work in the system. Because mu i minus mu e is assumed to be positive, we can conclude that IF minimizes the above expression. Hence, IF minimizes the expected number of jobs in the system over time. By Little's law, IF also minimizes the mean response time across jobs when mu i is greater than or equal to mu e. Unfortunately, we can immediately see that there is no analogous result when mu e is greater than mu i. Let's consider trying to prove the analogous version of our lemma in this case. We would need to show that when mu e is greater than mu i, 
EF not only minimizes the expected amount of elastic work in the system, but EF also minimizes the expected amount of total work in the system. While property one is still straightforward, property two no longer holds in general in this case. We can again think of our intuition from before. Although EF is maximizing the total service rate of the system in the current state, EF is also pushing us towards less efficient, less flexible future states. Hence, we can no longer claim that EF minimizes the expected total work in the system over time. So what can we take away from all this? Well, when mu i is greater than or equal to mu e, we are able to prove that IF is the optimal policy with respect to mean response time. Unfortunately, the greedy policy which favors small jobs doesn't always work. In particular, when mu i is less than mu e, EF is not the optimal policy. For the sake of completeness, we're able to numerically evaluate EF and IF using Markov chain techniques. This gives us some information on when, if ever, we should be using the EF policy. To visualize the results of our numerical analysis, let's return to our familiar graph with mu i on the x-axis and mu e on the y-axis. I'll put a red dot in every location where if beat ef, and I'll put a blue x in every location where ef beat if. As we would predict from the optimality of if, the if policy dominates in the lower triangular region. However, there is a significant upper triangular region where the ef policy beat if. This is only part of the story, however. This particular system had a fairly high arrival rate of jobs. If we lower the arrival rate of jobs to the system, we can see that the story begins to change. In this graph, with a medium arrival rate, the upper triangular region has begun to shrink. This trend continues as the arrival rate to the system drops, and eventually this upper triangular region will disappear altogether. To wrap things up, Today we discussed a model for server allocation in data centers where parallelizable jobs arrive to the data center over time. We included a model of workload heterogeneity that allows for both elastic and inelastic jobs of various sizes. We discussed how an optimal policy should balance the current performance of the system with future efficiency. Although we aren't able to find an optimal policy when elastic jobs are smaller than inelastic jobs on average, we are able to show that when inelastic jobs are smaller than elastic jobs on average, the optimal policy is inelastic first, or IF, which gives strict priority to inelastic jobs. This shows that by making stochastic assumptions, we are able to effectively get around the lower bounds that exist for worst case analysis. Thanks for watching, and I hope to hear from you during my question and answer session later this week.